Although I feel it is in rather poor taste for someone to respond to a person who refuses to allow video responses to his material, I think it is a reasonably valuable endeavor to attempt to offer a refutation of your assertions, such that a balanced view can be rendered upon this lofty and important subject of bioevolution. One must also make a point of noting, Venafang, that it is extremely disingenuous for you to ask evolutionists for proof, but at the same time refuse to allow that potential proof to be freely and openly aired on your channel through approval of video responses that run counter to your creationist sentiments. But be that as it may, let us begin. So let's begin by asking a, a simple question. How complex is a human being? Human beings are very complex, but what you're implying and trying to get at is a fallacy. It's an argument from incredulity, since you're implying that humans are too complex to have evolved by natural processes, so therefore God did it. Or there wasn't enough time for humans to evolve, so therefore God did it. Your entire argument from the very start is invalid, since it rests upon a fallacious premise. Evolutionists believe that two billion years ago, I don't know how they think they know this, but whatever, let's give it to them for now. Let's say that a single cell began to mutate and evolve two billion years ago, and it had to, you know, undergo a lot of changes, and eventually, through progressive generations, became a human being. Venom Fang, uh, that single cell you're talking about is properly termed prokaryotic life, and it did not occur two billion years ago. Try over 3.5 billion years ago. Evolutionists know this because of fossilized evidence. So how many changes would have had to have taken place? Well, I think about 1 to 10 trillion. That seems reasonable to me. So if we take the amount of time, 2 billion years, and divide it by the amount of changes, which is 1 to 10 trillion, you're left with a number between 20 to 2,000 changes per year. Minimum. That would be your average. So, here's my question to evolutionists. Um, obviously, if you believe life went from a single cell to the complexity of a human being in two billion years, that means a certain amount of changes would have had to have taken place. And if we look under a microscope at any given form of life, be it plant, animal, or even single-celled organisms, um, and we do not see the average amount of changes we would expect in order to facilitate the amount of changes necessary to go from a single cell to a human being in the amount of time that you guys claim that this happened, then we must conclude that you are wrong. Okay, this is the crux of your argument, and in a few words, it's completely ridiculous. It commits the fallacy of a non sequitur. Sean, you attempted to draw a conclusion from premises which do not rationally connect and therefore do not logically justify your bogus assertions. In this case, the crux of your argument was a certain amount of physical changes must take place to get from A to B, and if the amount of time asserted doesn't appear to be enough to bring off those changes, evolution could not have occurred, and your God must have made life as is instead of life evolving over a period of time. The simple answer for why you are wrong is that you seem to labor under the delusion that cellular evolution and biological evolution is inexorable and static, when in fact both can speed up, slow down, or not occur at all since both are driven by external factors. You can falsify my refutation of you, Sean, by proving that cells and biological taxonomy evolve at a steady, non-variable rate and always evolve regardless of whether selective pressures and environmental stimuluses are extant. If not, your argument and this video fail badly. Well, when we ask an evolutionist, you know, how long does it take to show us evolution? Because whenever we say, can you show us evolution happening today, what's the response? You guys know it. You guys know it as well as I do. They say, put your hand up if you've heard this, it takes millions and billions of years. Don't, don't they say that? Of course they say that. It's so much, you know, they say it so much it's like basically a stereotype. Yeah, you couldn't have been asking any informed evolutionists since they could give you examples of microevolution and that would be that. Mosquitoes evolving resistant to DDT is an example of evolution occurring without the invocation of millions and billions of years. So let's, uh, let's figure out if those changes are taking place because we can't push it back into the past anymore. We can't say, well, it's going to take a million years for a change to, to take place because uh, 
well, that simply would be impossible with the time that we need to uh, go from a single cell to a human being, which we've all agreed for what the evolutionists are saying is about two billion years. Again, your whole argument is worthless since it's predicated on the erroneous assumption that evolutionary changes occur in a uniform and static fashion, which they don't. Therefore, you cannot assert that a certain amount of time is insufficient for a certain amount of needed changes because biological changes don't occur in a mathematically fixed fashion. Evolution must be taking place a lot quicker than that if evolution is true. So, do we see those changes? Well, by virtue of the fact that they tell us it takes, you know, millions of years for changes to take place, shows us that no, we're not observing these changes. I don't know what you're talking about here. Anytime microevolution occurs, that's evolutionary change. There's no need for an evolutionist to say change only occurs over millions of years, so what you're saying doesn't make any sense. You can see physical evolutionary change with the house sparrow, which was introduced to North America in 1852. Since that time, the sparrows have evolved different characteristics in different locations. Sparrow populations in the north are larger bodied than sparrow populations in the south. This divergence in population is an example of evolutionary change. Larger body birds can often survive lower temperatures than smaller body birds can. So they might say, well, on a genetic level, yes, there are all kinds of changes going on. Well, you know, when people ask, you know, uh, us who believe in God, they say, can you show us God? And if you don't show me God, I'm not going to believe. Well, you know, it's very easy to say genetic changes take place, but uh, unless you show me, I'm not going to believe it. I'm certainly not going to believe that these genetic changes are the types of changes that will become physical attributes over any given amount of time unless you can show me. Unless we can show you? Why don't you look at your face? What do you think physical attributes are? They're manifestations of prior or current genetic change. What I'm basically saying is the 10 trillion or 1 trillion differences between a human being and a single cell are not simply genetic. They are physical. They are physical manifestations of these traits. So, to say that genetic changes are taking place doesn't really help your cause. We need 10 to 2,000 physical changes per, per year for the lifetime of any given organism, which uh, is simply not happening. Sorry, it, it's not. See the many examples of microevolution. Each one proves its current assertion wrong. So, uh, I think evolution's dead in the water now. Not even close, bud. In fact, you have to say that a lot of changes are taking place all of the time, and we don't see any of them. See any example of microevolution. Now, some might say, well, we see, you know, bacteria becoming immune to antibiotics, and we see things adapting to their environment, but they're missing the point. Those are not uh, changes in the complexity of the organism. Rather, they are alterations of the traits that it already has. No, that's exactly the point. You just sneakily move the goalposts. This is more deception from Sean. He point blank asks for examples of genetic and physical evolutionary changes, then turns around and moves the goalposts, claiming examples of microevolution are not examples of what he's asking for when they most certainly are. He then changes the crux of what he's asking and asserts he wants to see complexity and new information. What we need to see is bacteria getting new traits. And that is to say, new limbs, new organs, new complexity, not simply changing traits that it already has. Well, you need to ask your fairytale god to do that for you, because you're asking for magic, not evolution. Evolution doesn't work in the way Sean is asserting it should work, and it needs to get briefed on what macroevolution is. Not as fairytale ad hoc definition of what macroevolution is, but what the actual biological definition is. Evolution is dead in the water because we simply do not see these physical traits emerging at all. At all. Yeah. Again, see microevolution, and after that, the stuff you're asking for will falsify evolution since what you're asking for is magical changes in variation in biological taxa. You know, some people are going to try and say, well, um, you know, because mutation, they say, is the cause of additional traits. But they forget that uh, if mutations are indeed doing what they say they do, there would be more detrimental mutations than beneficial ones, because remember, it's random mutation, which means it's going to make more mistakes than it's going to make beneficial mutations. This final assertion I'm going to feel is worthless, since mutations are not the sole driver of evolution. Here is a list of processes that drive evolution. 
natural selection, mutations, environmental pressure, gene duplication, genetic drift, vertical gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer, and biological adaptation. This ends the first installment of the counter-refutation series.